everybody, teachers. Hello from different countries around the world. The time where you are watching and streaming now, we are cordially invited and we are here. So excited to start our teacher's interview. What in the world you are? Okay, maybe you can type in the chat or maybe you can make a comment in the YouTube channel when this um, video will be edited and uploaded. So it's a pleasure, more than a, than a satisfaction to share with the EFL community. Uh, yes, Mr. Carlos Carranza, hello from Manaví, Ecuador. Okay, and other teachers from Peru, from Ecuador, and from other uh, um, countries, places, you're more than welcome. Okay, today we have a special guest. She is uh, a mentor, she is a teacher. Uh, before I said her name, I, I'm, I'm so excited to introduce a little bit more about her. Well, the first time I met, and we, I will be honest with you, I noticed that she was very charismatic because in the in the Facebook and the social media, so she tried to present her classes. She uploaded uh, interesting content in language teaching, not only about English, Interestingly, we're going to mention French. That's another language. So during the interview, we're going to, <laughs> to talk about that too. So Miss Monica Perla, she's from Lima, Peru. Yes? yes. So we are so excited to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here with all of you. Thank you, Mr. Rodriguez, for the invitation. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here and to share this time with all of you guys. And uh, well... Uh, what can I say? I'm very pleased to share um, this moment with you and all the things that you want to tell me that you would like to ask. I don't know. Um, for me, it's kind of like um, I'm <laughs> weird because it's like I'm, I'm the one who asks the questions in class. So it's kind of like right now I feel like the student <laughs> so in some way. No, and it's kind of funny. I'm always joking. That's one of the things that I always do. So it's like, for me, it's uh, regular stuff. Yeah, it's one of my skits. So yeah, I always joke and I always make fun of myself. I'm kind of used to being a camera because my my because of my, my job. I mean, it's what I do on a daily basis almost. Yeah, even sometimes on Sundays when we have a conference or when we have some kind of, yeah, a round table, when we have a webinar, so. It could be also on, on weekend. So it's it's a pleasure to be here and to share. Um, well, what I've learned during these years and uh, my experiences, my anecdotes, and to answer all of your questions, um, basically that. Yes, thank you so much for having me here. Okay, um, Miss Monica, don't don't feel that you feel that you feel pressed in this moment. So because that's not a. That's not a class. You don't have to feel that you are in a place in a court. No, you will simply exchange. We are going to we're going to talk about different things. Teachers they also involve in asking questions, but uh, the idea is not to feel ashamed about being here. So it's an interview. It's friendly. Okay, it's friendly because we are going to um, share different uh, insights about our experience when we teach English or different classes but it's more like um, exchanging ideas, all right? So that's the point, okay? So um, um, I think uh, my, my colleagues there also um, uh, contributed with their opinions when they make comments uh, on the experience they make in the, in the classroom. So that's the idea that we are going to reach our knowledge with that, okay? Well, okay. so, uh, Miss Monica, we are so curious and we would like to know uh, when and where did you start your teaching practice? I'm not talking about online teaching. I'm talking about teaching. Yes, in general, presential teaching. Can you talk about your origins? When did you start? When? Uh, where was the first school you, you, you start working as an English teacher? So the curious thing here is like, I have, uh, I love languages in general. Um, I've been a teacher for almost 22 years. Um, <laughs> but I was like, I mean, I loved languages since the very beginning. 
uh, but I wasn't exactly like um, attracted to the teaching thing <laughs> before when I was a teenager because Believe it or not, I wasn't exactly like uh, the most, uh, you know, responsible or or obedient student at school. Yes, and my teachers know that, so I'm really sorry they are seeing this. You know, <laughs> so not, my apologies for being such a terrible kid. But yes, when I was a teenager, I wasn't exactly pretty easy uh, because I was. Um, I, I liked lots of stuff: art and music and literature and languages. I didn't like much. I wasn't getting exactly along with math, for example, or science. I was very interested, but I was like not very, I could never focus on that enough. So I was like, okay, so languages and literature and that that's my area. And also I thought, okay, let's give it a try. But it wasn't like uh, something that like, I felt like it was a cool. No, I felt like it was oh, a cool experience. So I started well, actually, I started my English studies when I was very, very young. Uh, when I was like six or seven at school, I had amazing teachers. Uh, and um, I started with British English, by the way. And on my elementary or primary school, no, I mean, in my country, we call it primary school. In other countries, it's elementary school. Uh, and then when I moved to secondary or middle and high school, um, I started with American English. So in my case, it was both ways. And for me, it was really cool because I could listen to different accents. So, yeah. Um, curiously, I didn't start teaching English. I started teaching French, and which I learned when I was like 17. So that was kind of a weird thing because I, I, I already knew English, but I started with French, which was at that moment a bit more difficult, but it was cool. I was very interested in French because... Um, I liked it. I liked literature and my favorite authors were in French. So I wanted to read them in the original language as I did in English. So yeah, I started with that 22 years ago, almost in July. And um, and then when then I continued with English, I started not in a school. Actually, I always work or most of the time I work with language centers. I remember there was this small uh, language center in um, here in Lima, Target language center. They all, well, they taught uh, English and French and also Spanish for foreigners. Um, with uh, my dear friend, Paola Mendieta, she was a one amazing teacher who gave me the my first chance to start teaching, who gave me lots of tips uh, and yeah, lots of patience because she was super patient with me. Uh, she encouraged me to do other things that I wasn't exactly very confident to do like interviewing other teachers for example that was like a scary moment <laughs> I remember once she wanted to she she needed to do something and she couldn't attend some kind of schedule interview for other teachers position and I had to do the interview and I was so nervous because most of the teachers I was very young I was like probably 22 or something and they were older than me and I was so scared and I I'm going to do I'm going to mess this up. Oh my God. Oh my God. I was super scared, but I did it. <laughs> At the end, I did it. So um, all my life, I've noticed that, yes, most of the time I'm scared about something, but then I do it and then it scares away. So um, yeah, and I don't mind much about making mistakes. So if you notice that I make a mistake, so it's like my thing, you know? <laughs> so it's like, I know probably how to do it correctly, but when I talk, it's like, that's okay. So yeah, and I always encourage my students to do the same, not to make mistakes exactly on purpose, but if they make a mistake, okay, that's okay. Fall down, okay, again, stand up, just, you know what, and let's continue, let's move on, no worries. We are going to learn from this mistake. So I learned from lots of mistakes that I've been making during my entire career. And uh, I started in this language center, I worked there like for probably, four years or something like that. Uh, but uh, at the same time, the following year, you know, one year, when I was already working in that in an institute for one year, I started at uh, La Molina Language Center, the language center of the university, La Molina here in Peru. And uh, I, well, that was a great experience also because I found lots of people, lots of good professionals. I have, well, friendships that are basically are uh, you know, for like 
yeah, basically, I have some friends, like, probably for 20 years or something like that there, and they are amazing people, and there, there are more languages, uh, I think they also teach German, they teach Quechua, also, and Japanese, Chinese, and stuff like that, I always wanted to learn that, I ended up learning Portuguese in my language, in my, in that language center, too, and um, I enjoy the process. I also uh, taught uh, pre TOEFL courses and TOEFL courses, and that was quite interesting. And yeah, that's basically, please stop me if I'm talking too much because I tend to talk a lot. <laughs> that's another thing. I tend to talk a lot. I'm an uh, Don't worry, don't worry, Miss Mom. <laughs> well, the, the question that I made for you at the beginning, it was about your origin. So, I can imagine that you need to uh, um, uh, you need to talk about a little bit more because uh, that's uh, what you did in the past. So thanks for sharing with that. Okay, I was I was very young when I started. I started like when I was twenty. Yeah, when I was twenty because I wasn't even I hadn't even finished my I mean the the English the French studies I finished them faster for a reason. Ah, oh, because I was studying also design graphic design for a while for a year. And wow. so I had to stop for a moment English. Uh, and then when I had to finish my studies, I has, I was already working in teaching French. Um, and I also had a side, I always have, I constantly have side hustles and my family sometimes says, they say, okay, you're working too much. But it's like, they taught me how to side hustle all the time. I mean, my family is a family of people who basically, do business i mean they are side hustlers they are people who have projects on their own they are solopreneurs they have yeah and i've done that for basically my entire life so for me it wasn't like a strange thing to have a side hustle besides my teaching gig so i also worked um in other things and um, i enjoyed the experience to share teaching and also being kind of like a business person although I was very young to understand the whole concept, but it was cool. So, and after being like for probably eight years there, yeah, seven, seven and a half, almost eight years at uh, La Grande University, I started working in another uh, language institute here, in Interglobal Language Institute. And then I had more responsibilities because it was an institute that was uh, linked to another institute in the United States which is Uceda Institutes. I still, now I've been, it's curious because I thought uh, that probably when I finished working there, because I was pursuing other things in my life, I thought, okay, maybe I'm not going to see them. I'm going to miss my friends, my boss and stuff. But now I'm working back and back with them for a little, for some time, because um, I have some, some uh, courses with them in the mornings. They work online. They have this English Line Academy where I also part of the staff, no? And um, yeah, I worked with them from probably 2007 to 2012 or something. Yes, and I was a teacher and I also administrated a TOEFL exam because they were certified for, for, the, for the TOEFL test. So I had to administrate the TOEFL examinations, which is quite a, a responsibility because um when you do that it's like there is no much room for flaws there so if, if you make a mistake there is like it could cost the student exam so you have to be very careful with the technology because it's the ibt test so it's connected to computers if there's a failure in anything you need to yeah. know how to do in that case which is scary sometimes there are students from all over the world, not only from Lima, but people who were like passing by or I don't know, coming as a tourist or I don't know, for any reason here in Peru. And they decided to take the exam here in Peru. So it was like, also you had to know a little bit of other languages to try to help them, you know, in the in the process. And it was a fun experience too. Um, then I stopped for a while working for other people for institutes and schools. I also worked in a small school in a, with little kids, but then I stopped because I focused more on my family business, which is my mom's business. My mom is a craft woman and she makes her own stuff, you know, and 
and she's been working on that actually for 20 years. Yesterday we celebrated 20 years. So the 20th anniversary of that project. And um, the thing is that I was so uh, committed to that project that I didn't stop teaching languages, but I had to make a pause from teaching for other people. So I started on my own. That's where I started on my own, on my own, no? Thank and you I so much that's... for sharing that part of your life because I see that it's like a journey. You know? I send my greetings to the people who connected now, okay? We are in the teacher's interview with Miss Monica Perla. She's from Lima, Peru. Okay, so we are sharing now. Well, Miss Monica has shared with us about the, or her origins. You heard about the experience of the, the workplaces where, they, where she has been uh, there. And something that I hear you lately, Miss Monica, is the experience with the IBT TOEFL, no? In one of the last uh, language center that you mentioned where you work. So yeah. the IBT TOEFL, I know it because I've already taken, and some of the teach of the language teachers know know it because um, it's an international and proficiency exam, okay, that is a requirement in our countries, for example, in, in your in your in your case in Peru, in well in Ecuador, okay, it's considering in the official list where the Ministry of Education for English teacher we are committed to uh to take him. So um so interestingly interestingly I I heard about French and I and I know it. I I'm I feel fantastic because uh, uh, French is a language I also have studied before when I was uh in the in the faculty of language when I studied here in, in Wyoming. Yeah, so, uh, uh, yeah, it's so lovely, you know, to hear French that, no. So, um, another question that I would like to ask you, it's about uh, if you have chosen uh, between English and French about teaching, um, or you have taken English in advance to to, to teach in different schools. Or, or just in case you will continue preparing uh, French, in, I don't know, in the future. So can you explain us a little bit more about it? About uh, if I will continue preparing, I mean, enhancing my my, my level of English and, and French. Yeah, so if, uh, if you stop teaching French, or so you will consider teaching French in the future? Oh yeah, no, 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 I never stopped teaching French. Okay. <laughs> So I, I was actually teaching French and English you know, both at the same time. And um, yeah, I mean, I've always, I started with French. <laughs> the, the hardest part was that I started with a, the the third language, you no? Know? Uh, English is like my second language, you no? Know? It's because I, I, I know it forever, but like in English, I thought I was like, I felt safer, but I don't know why at that point in my life I, I accepted the French gig and I started with that and then I realized it was basically like a Spanish. So uh, I never stopped teaching uh, French. I actually continued teaching French even if I was in an in some institutes, for example, in, at La Gran University, the language center, they teach different kinds of languages, but in the other places, they only taught English. So, okay, so in that case, I was you know in basically trying to or contact people or create groups to make English courses you know all the time so I was always in touch with languages the only language that I have to confess I wasn't in touch with was Portuguese because um I got you know a little bit away from Portuguese because I was very busy but it was a big mistake now I noticed after some years uh I noticed that um, it's getting rusty when you don't practice something it gets like that so uh, languages are like that if you don't practice them like on a daily basis and that's what I always tell my student it's basically not like you have a higher IQ or that you have more skills I mean probably people think that I'm more skilled for some things and it's not true I don't have a well, my IQ is my IQ and that's it but it's just like it's not important when it comes to this Actually, here, what is important is practice. The most important things are three. Practice, practice, practice. Yeah. That's it. 
Yes, I totally agree with you. Even Stephen Krashen said that the second language acquisition of the language is naturally and and intrinsically uh, born. You no, know, when when the when the when the when the child absorbs or take you no know, from the bilingual environment. So when and they naturally uh, speak, uh, listen. But we need constantly to develop uh, our skills. You no. Know? similarly as we acquire the first language, our mother tongue, which is Spanish. Yes, Mr. Carlos Carranza in this moment is raising the hand. Mr. Carlos, please, you can go ahead and ask the question, please. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and listening to Miss Monica Perla. Um, I would like to ask you, Miss, about education in Peru. Do you have uh, drawbacks in the public education. What is uh, the interfering of the Ministry of Education of Peru uh, with the English teachers there? How is it working over there? Because here in Ecuador, we don't have English books, free English books for the students. And they say that uh, we don't have to ask them to buy any. They have to print, but the students don't have money to print. We have drawbacks a lot, of, but I don't know. What about Peru? How is it being an English teacher in Peru? Um, that's quite like, a, you, you're going to believe it or not, but it, I thank you for your question, by the way. Um, um, it's very similar in some aspects. Actually, I have, uh, as uh, Mr. Rodriguez knows, he, I have several students from Ecuador, yes, from many places. I'm always in touch with them. And um, I know, I know the concerns there are towards education and uh, also in Latin America. I mean, I, I have students all across Latin America and I think the problems are quite similar. Uh, the Ministry of Education here doesn't do much actually for, for trying to close this gap that we have between, uh, for example, no education of English in Lima is something very different from rural education, not the education that we have in the other cities of my country. The same happens in Ecuador, in Colombia, in Uruguay, in many places, because it doesn't matter what country you are in Latin America, it's basically the same. Uh, the access to, for example, textbooks, uh, we do have, uh, I mean, the Ministry of Education does some kind of books, but they are too basic and they are always like the same things that students have already seen for years. That's why they get bored easily. And it's not like a big help from uh, for teachers when they have to prepare classes. During the pandemics, uh, my colleagues who were in, public, in the public sector, they actually had to make their own material. And it was like an amazing... Most of people don't recognize that, but it, it was like an amazing job. And I want to say that Aprendo en Casa was one of the best things I've ever seen. As And I, I have students everywhere. So that I was asking country by country, nationality by nationality, do you have a program like this? And I shared my screen with a program, with a website, with everything. No means we don't have that here. So uh, really, I'm really proud of my colleagues here, my Peruvian colleagues, because they did an amazing job during the pandemics. Uh, they created this platform, Aprendo en Casa, which was amazing with lots of resources, but they had to work until two, three in the morning. How do I know that? Because we share WhatsApp groups. So my phone was ringing all the time. Oh, do you know this, Monica? Do you have this, Monica? Yeah, and say, oh my God, I don't know because I'm not, I'm not in a public school. So, okay, but I have this. So we were always coordinating stuff, two, three in the morning. So, Yes, we are presenting lots of um, challenges in our region, lots of them. And uh, and they are not faced in the proper way. And we have the money to face them because I'm pretty sure that we do. But there is no will to do it. <laughs> so I cannot be more honest. I'm very honest. And people who know me, they know that I'm super honest in this. Yes, uh, there are amazing teachers here. Actually, we were awarded twice with the award for the best teacher in the world and uh, in less than five years. But uh, that is because they did it on their own, <laughs> not because someone, and the schools 
supported them. You know, their school supported them, not because the Ministry of Education was supporting them. So that was the truth. Now that was the true thing. So to tell you the truth is basically like that. You no, know, the the situation in Latin America uh, is very very um, concerning in terms of education in general and in terms of language education is it's even more concerning. We're not saying another word because I don't want to say more. So, but it's like that. And I completely understand. I know that you're going through this uh, blackouts, program blackouts. We also lived that during the 80s. So now I, I know what it's like because I, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, we went through a very awful time. And the, the area where I used to live was considered an industrial area, which was not true, but anyway. <laughs> and we had blackouts almost every night for four years. Can you believe that? It was, I think we're gonna make a break. We're gonna, yeah, we're, we're gonna have a break, I guess. This is just less than a minute here. Yes, sure. Miss Monica. Uh, so, uh, we are going to have one minute to to finish right now this part, but we are going okay. to connect with the same link. All uh, right, perfect. Yeah, yeah, but don't worry about it. So we are going to join to the same link, okay? We're gonna we're gonna have right to breathe. <laughs> to exactly. <them> <laughs> don't worry. You can drink water. You can go to the oh, yes, <laughs> another place. Yes, yes. It's course. okay. Yeah, that was an amazing question. Mr. Carlos, Mr. Carlos Carranza was right when he was uh, asking the the question about the, the, our our country, I'm and really right. you were right with the what is happening in Latin America. So. You In this, in this section, yes, we are going to talk about with, Mo with Monica Perla about different topics. But now teachers can ask more questions if you feel curious, if you want to know more about it. This is the moment that you would like to share with, with her, no? So we are invited to raise your hand and you can ask her something, okay? Let's go, my dears. Let's see who asks the first shoot, please. No yes. Person. Mr. Carlos, again, obviously. Go ahead, Mr. Carlos. Uh, Miss uh, Monica, I know that in Peru, you have the program for the English teachers, Ecuador Habla Inglés. I don't know if that is, I mean, my maybe the name is Peru Habla Inglés. But in here, the name is Ecuador Habla Inglés. That's the name here. Do you, uh, what is your opinion about the program? Has this program helped the English teachers to improve their English methodology, their techniques, and their proficiency in the English language or not? The programs could be well intentioned and well structured, uh, but I think it will also depend on some other factors. For example, uh, the availability of the students in terms of time. Sometimes the students, uh, they have time, but they don't get organized well. So, and that's why I always talk to my students. You at least have to have 15 minutes a day to practice, but it's not like you have to practice, oh, from Monday to Friday, oh, no, only when I have classes, because normally I have classes from Monday to Thursday in America, which is where I teach the most. Uh, it's from Monday to Thursday. No, 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 no. You have to speak English on a, I mean, on a daily basis. So that is the one thing that we have to change, the mindset. The mindset of my students, uh, Latin American students in general, uh, not only Peruvian students, is like uh, sometimes they practice when there is a class or right after the class and then they forget about English, they close the book and bye-bye. No, and that is not the mindset if you want to achieve, uh, you know, a, a good, uh, you know, level, you know, of English or French or any language that you want to study. If you want proficiency, if you want to achieve proficiency and, and, and to have a, a good level, what I consider a good level because nobody's perfect, um, you need to practice a lot. And that's the key thing. Many people think it's a thing about, for example, what you mentioned rest, uh, about uh, having the background, you know, because it's uh, the acquisition of the second language. 
But in my case, the only uh, thing was the, the music. I mean, my parents and their very uh, eclectic music uh, likes. I mean, my father listening to, um, I don't know, uh, lots of things, uh, George Benson and uh, Black Sugar and Santana. And my mom, I'm salsa, of course. And my mom listened to Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath. So it was like a strange mix. <laughs> and plus my, my, I mean, the music from my country, from some parts of the center of my country, because my mom is from a place called Jauja, uh, which is in Huancayo. It's a big city in the middle of the country. And um, so all these influences of languages that I didn't know at the beginning uh, were probably what made me be curious about languages. So curiosity and practice, I think that they are two key ingredients for achieving success in something. But uh, I think the programs that they are structuring, some of them, as I said, Aprendo en Casa during the pandemic, that it still continues, but people had this strange feeling about that because I think it's probably also the bad memories that we have, you know, around that uh, that time where it was when it was made um they actually didn't give them the the the, the recognition that actually they deserve and um i think the programs could be really good but we need to have teachers that are better prepared better paid well rested uh, because if they are not well rested if you have to for example we have a train here right now we have the metro uno uh but we're gonna have the metro dos like in four or five years that's not gonna help. Um, we have teachers that have to travel an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, or like one of our colleagues who got lost in the middle of the mountains for eight days, I think it was, here in Peru, we thought the worst. And oh my God, it was fantastic when we heard that she was okay, that she had an accident, she tripped, she fell, uh, she had a broken ankle, but she's Oh, other than, other than that, she's okay. She's doing well. And she's so hardworking and so devoted to her students that she wants to come back. And she teaches in a very small school that has only six students. So can you believe that? For six students, she's doing that sacrifice that she has to walk, I don't know, like two hours. She has to cross like a, some kind of extinct river. That's where, where she tripped and fell. And then she has to go up again, and then she has to go to that school that doesn't have technology, that doesn't have Wi-Fi, that doesn't have anything, but she goes there because she loves teaching. So that's the kind of teachers that we have in South America, in Central America, in Latin America in general. But the thing is that we do not have the resources that we need. That's one thing. We don't have the training programs. For example, I remember the UPSA University here in Lima, which is a private university, but they also have some kind of programs that accord, they agree with some um, districts or um, governments or department, uh, you know, authorities to send a group of teachers from every single department because our, my country is divided in politically in departments or, or regions also. So they have to agree on sending a group of teachers to go there and to get a training that is exclusively for teachers who pay. Now, in my case, I went independently, so, but I saw groups of people who were coming from many different parts of Peru, and I was gladly surprised that some uh, authorities send their teachers because they actually care about that, but not all of them do it. So that's, that's the problem. So we are not, I mean, we are not getting, you know, equal opportunities. No, I think this, for example, this, in, this is an interview and I know, and I'm very glad to be here, but this is also a resource. And we should expand this kind of resources, free resources or low ticket resources for the most of people because uh, that's what our people need. They need to study. That's the key for everything, for progress, for financial freedom. Uh, and that's what I advocate for. Uh, I advocate for financial freedom in general, not only for women, but in general for financial freedom from companies, from institutions, and that includes the schools. Yes, I mean, the teacher can have a good salary. If they have a good salary, I will be happy. If they have a good pension, you know, a good retirement program, I will be glad to hear that. But I know that in my country, that is not gonna happen. So we have to hustle a lot and we have to find other ways, 
other ways. So financial freedom it is. Financial education for teachers, financial education for all people, financial education for high school students also, because that's going to open them, uh, open a world of, of full of new opportunities and also more education in other areas, not only languages. So, and that's going to be the success in their life. That's going to be a, a, a game changer. It doesn't happen naturally, so we have to create it. So we are creating it right now in these spaces that we, we have right now, getting together, no. Uh, so in that way, we open a space for people to talk freely about what they feel, about what they think, the, to give their opinions and to also share their knowledge and to share the knowledge with others. No, so this is giving access to education. So that's why I think this is great. Yeah, thank you for your question. I always expanding my answer, so. <laughs> Interestingly, uh, thank you so much, Mr. Carlos, for asking the question. Uh, well, Miss Monica has said every, every, uh, all. So yeah, Miss Monica, there's an insight that I remark in your, uh, in your arguments. For example, a space online spaces like this. So we are here. We are here. Different people from different countries. So practicing the English language. So opportunities that overcome that we take it for granted. They come first, and then we. It depends on us. And we have good results. So opportunity. There are opportunities for people that when they when they take advantage of them. So in my opinion, I believe that the, it exists opportunity that we have to take them and we have to to make them happen. No, uh, for example, um, I I don't want to be ex implicit in in a, uh, in education in terms of of public service. Because sometimes the governments they offer, but they don't have enough resources to help us. But we can find different solutions. For example, the America, so the American embassy here in in Ecuador. I, I'm not sure in Peru. I think they similarly they can work together, but they cooperate. For example, and they send us uh, to our country. Um, I, I don't know how to, to explain it. They are young uh, people that help, and uh, they are native speakers, no? That they contributed, uh, they are, they they are called the Peace Corps, okay? Because they call in the Spanish Cuerpo de Paz, no? The, the Peace Corps, no? And they do it for free. They help. I'm not sure if they receive any economic warning, but they no, do it. They don't. they don't, okay, so they love it, they're passionate, and they help in the rural areas. And they also contributed to, to, to some teachers. And I think that we can uh, take advantage of those uh, opportunities to, to, uh, to learn or to improve our, our practice, no? Yes, I think it's it's great what they do. And there are many other groups of volunteering people who actually help us enhance our skills. I have uh, most, uh, probably my closest friends are overseas. <laughs> yes, they are. Well, I have very good friends here in Peru, but also many good, good friends are in other countries. And, uh, and they are... They, they love volunteering for this kind of programs. And yes, we have similar things here. And I think it's good, although I don't think it's enough because we we are still lacking of, we are lacking of so many things. As uh, Carlos was saying, you know, um, are we really getting to to the, you know, the, the target audience here? Uh, I think we still have many, many things that we have to cover many necessities that we have to fulfill in people because they are willing to learn. I, and you know, you know that because you also participated in the program of uh, Asociación Alvaro, uh, that there are so many people that want to learn. I, at one point, I, would say, I remember we had like a, more than a hundred students who were trying to <laughs> do yes, as we could. Yeah, because it was amazing. I mean, the the people really wanted to help, and they were so committed that 
um, I don't know, be connected from the craziest places and the, on the phone, on the bus, on a taxi. It didn't matter if they had light or not at home. They were just trying to get at least 20 minutes of the class. It was amazing. Um, the thing is that I still think that it's not enough. We, we have to also push our governments to do something else much more than we are doing because they are not doing enough. Not only enough, they are almost doing nothing. So uh, they are not rewarding students. They are not rewarding teachers. Here, for example, we have cool programs. One program that is very cool, uh, it's about the, uh, uh, there is a special school for gift students that is basically uh, you know by the government and it's great it's working great they have I mean it's like the bachillerato something like that no uh, for students that are in situations that uh, they don't have the economical resources to go to great schools private schools and stuff like that they have a great education there and they can go to they can apply to any university in the world so and that's a great program and I applaud that I'm 100% with that but still this is a very small group and our target audience is millions we have a population here in peru of 33 million people and uh, probably more than 60 percent of that are minors so we are not actually in my case it's even more because in my case it's you basically have to take out the only the toddlers and the rest of the population is my target audience because i teach teenagers and also adults not only school students so we if, if school students teenagers children don't have access to a better education in english they don't have access to a third language like french or portuguese uh adult students have it worse because they are more complicated with schedules they are already creating uh, their own lives they are uh, forming a family they are having babies they have very low incomes and reduced economical resources and the amount of time that they can devote to the studies is, is very limited. So that is the thing that I think is, um, that, that, that is a big problem, big social problem and a political problem because it's, they have, some people in the government have the good intentions to open more programs and enhance the programs that we already have, but they don't because there are other people who are pushing them down and saying, no, this is not good, maybe next year and so on. So they are basically, you know, trying to make time and gain some time to just make them forget about the programs, no? So that's why we have to open spaces like this. So we can make everyone participate. That's, that's I think, the not the only way i still keep my hopes up i mean maybe we have someday a president or someday a minister of, a minister of education who is going to uh, you know do something else but um i have to be realistic and uh we have to do it on our own we are basically latin americans we're strong people but we have been we have been uh, told that we they are going to do something for us and we are still waiting so we have to do something on our own. We have to open more spaces. And yes, we also have to raise awareness of the importance of having a second or even a third language, especially because our countries, like Ecuador, for example, it's a very touristic country. So there are so many things that are exclusively for Ecuador, for example. And uh, you cannot get those things or those places or those animals anywhere in the world. So we are not focusing on some areas, for example, the... Um, uh the the tourist the touristic area no so we are gentrifying places but we are not focusing on the local needs they need education they need language education they need general education and they also need financial education so um it it will change ecuador and my country and the rest of the countries for good but i don't think that that's in the you know in the agenda of most governments right now so it's like that no that's why we have to open those spaces and that's why i like participating in volunteer programs because that helps a lot of people so i can reach more people with those yeah exactly miss monica thanks thanks mr carlos again so volunteering campaigns 
I'm not sure if you have heard before such a, a global citizens, no? This is a social movement with volunteers that support not only with social needs, no? For example, uh, I don't know, people from Africa uh, or from other places in the world, even in Latin America, for example, countries like Brazil, okay, in the different zones, in different areas and countries, for example, like Colombia, Ecuador in my country, Peru, yours, and all, and so on, other countries, so that we similarly live in some, uh, there are some extreme uh, poor, con poorest conditions, no, that the governments forget, or they don't pretend to, uh, uh, to work on future projects, so that, that, that the intention of implementing, implementing these online spaces is, uh, to contribute to help, no, to hear people's voice, no, to revoice yeah. teachers' voice, no, like you, like me, Mr. Carlos, and others that they want to ask questions and also want to inspire other people. Yeah. Exactly. Yes, exactly. So that's 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 what I think. No, we have to do it on our own. We have to. We we see that even if they have the intention, we are a lot of people right now. So. We still have to work a lot. And even if they say, okay, we're going to work together, but still there is a lot of people that we have to try to help. And we have to we have to hurry because they need it now. They need now because the, the economy, it's no secret for anyone. It's been affected by numerous things that are happening around the world. So uh, we need to help these people now. We need to give them resources to survive, to make their businesses grow, to send their kids to better places to have better opportunities in life and they don't exactly need to leave their countries that's what i'm seeing you know what i've seen in my country and what i'm seeing everywhere now they are leaving their countries uh because of the, the lack of education lack of money lack of opportunities and it shouldn't be like that because in our countries we have everything we need so i never needed to go to another country to learn my language the, the second language i learned it here and the third one and the fourth one i learned it here it was just my will to learn, yes. The support of my family, yes. And let's face it, uh, I had the chance to study. I had the chance to to do some other things that other people cannot do. You know, I could afford it. And at the same time, I also planned my life in a different way, but because of my mindset, because of the way I think. You no, know, uh, in many other countries, in my country, is like that. You no. Know? Especially as, and I don't want to sound like I'm feminist, but it's like that. If we are women, so they are always asking you, when am I getting married or something like that? <laughs> and sometimes those questions don't help. <laughs> don't help specifically when we're talking about education and education, access to education. It's difficult already for men, imagine for women. So um, those kind of things should also be rethought. And um, those kind of thoughts had to be and, and that's education that's the education's job i mean it's going to it's going to help a lot in, in reducing this kind of ideas that, that we have to do a life in a certain way to basically accomplish or fulfill the society needs or you know what what the society wants from us no actually we have to be independent of that now we have to bear be very uh, focus focus on, on, on what we want to do, not what the society wants from us necessarily, no? Or we have to turn this on or the computer goes off. Yes, so I always plan my life in a way that I didn't plan it on purpose, but it was like uh, I never planned to create a family, for example, before I was like at least 30. It didn't work. <laughs> I got married when I was 40, 24. <laughs> I got married very young. But I didn't plan to have a family family. So uh, because I wanted to focus not on my career, I wanted to focus on me. I wanted to focus on the world, on the things that I could learn. And we are thought, we are we are taught since we are little kids that, for example, boys have to do some things and girls have to do some other things. And if you're a boy, you have to work because you have to support your family. You know, it doesn't matter if you have dreams or not, you have to support your family. So, but no, I want to study English. I want to be a French teacher. No, it doesn't matter. You have, you have to support your family to go and drive a taxi. Basically, that's that's the way it is, no? If you're a girl, I say, oh, well, you got, you got pregnant. Okay, yeah, well, what are you going to do? You are just meant to have babies and that's it. 
no, but I, after having the baby, I'm going to study at least online. No, no. Why are you going to study? Why are you going to study? So there are many prejudices and there are many, uh, you know, uh, thoughts like this that don't help a lot in terms of uh, facilitating people uh, to get through this ed educational path, you know, both for men and women, you know, they have this preconcepts that we have in life that we have to do this we have to do that we have to get married we have to have kids we have to have a dog we have to have a house we have to have oh my god it's like we have to basically it's like basically you know checking 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 a bucket list you no know? so we are not a bucket list we are people <laughs> so that's what we have to uh, tell the kids that they can do whatever they want to do when they are at school for example they start they stop dreaming at some point to become scientists or to become uh, uh, someone famous or to become a, a singer or to become a dancer because someone tells them, no, 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 that's not, a, that's not good. No, 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 if you study art, you're going to, you know, die, die of famine. You're not gonna, never gonna have anything to eat. So that's not, that's not a good job. My three nephews, uh, my first one, uh, he wanted to be, a, he wanted to study history. Everyone told him, Oh, no, 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 no. That's not a good idea in Peru. But in Peru, I mean, there's a lot of history. No, 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 no. You're going to be really, really badly paid. You're going to have a really awful salary. You know what? So, well, I said, no, if you want to study that, study that. So he registered and uh, now he's a very old archaeologist. And my other two nephews are also archaeologists. And my brother is also an archaeologist. So I have four archaeologists in my family. Very proud of it because I actually stopped them from making him uh, something that they wanted to make with him, you know? It's like, no, you have this life, we have thought this life for you and you're going to become a something, but not an archeologist or not a historian, no, no. So we have to stop those kind of thoughts and kids stop dreaming when they are at school. And that's a super dangerous thing because they start thinking, I'm not allowed to dream because my family is poor, because I cannot get education. I'm never going to see the Eiffel Tower. I'm never going to speak French because it's difficult, because we have no money, because someone tells me that I speak wrong. Those things kill the enthusiasm. We are basically killing people's, and not only people, kids' dreams. That's what we systematically are doing, and society does it. But we also collaborate because we don't say, hey, don't say that to a kid. If the girl wants to be a an astronomer, she can be an astronomer. If the guy wants to be a dancer, he can be a dancer. That's okay. Never tell that to kids. And that's a problem. We cannot, we have to reassure them that they can be whatever they want, whenever they want, and in their own terms. And those kind of things also encourage me to pursue my career as a teacher, or basically I'm like, I feel more than a teacher, like some kind of companion in this journey of learning process. You know some sort of thing you know so that more like a that my my students always make fun of me and they say teacher you're more than a teacher you're a psychologist i'm not a psychologist <laughs> probably no i'm i will be a really bad psychologist i guess but uh i always try to get first uh an idea of the mindset of my class or an idea of the mindset of every student because i need to know what what i'm working with who is this person who is in front of me and wants to learn? Because if the person has a problem, it's going to be almost impossible to work with. If you can, you know, try to detect the problem in that way, you can work with that mind. And if you immediately recognize some red flags or some things that could be fixed or that require some specialists to be fixed, you have to tell the student, you know what, you need this. Or if you can fix them, okay we're not going to talk about english today we're going to talk about business we're going to talk about your problem we're going to talk about your divorce we're going to talk about you. it's like that so i work with adults and adults have lots of problems and this is a perception that most people have but they never mention it they always say kids and i understand that many here probably most of you are uh, teachers from you know school teachers and i totally understand and uh, and I'm very I'm very I really applaud the effort that you make for for standing with a class of thirty kids or more. It's like amazing. But uh, 
uh, teaching adults, it's it has its its own thing, you know. It's got its own complications. Sometimes they have their own issues, and you have to try to solve them while you're teaching them, because you cannot abandon the person and just teach them simple present and the auxiliary don't and doesn't, and then forget that that's a person who is receiving the information. And you have to try to help the person first. So if the person is better, she the person is going to absorb the information in a better way. That's what I try to do. Um, sorry to interrupt here. We have some questions here. I'm sorry, it's not a damn ignoring. Yeah, let me read you because yeah, there's a, please, there's please a see, yes. question about it. Yeah, okay. So um, the question, okay, give me one second, please. The, questions, the question is, how can we Ecuadorians in general know improve English? What can you tell us? Maybe we cannot see what what uh, can improve because we are living in our own culture. So that person is asking about that we are living in an EFL country, so as a second language. U.S. teacher who taught Ecuadorian improve. What do you think are the areas that we can improve? Thank you, Prof. Monica. <laughs> Hello, Prof. Monica. I like it. <laughs> okay, um, because here in Peru, we are called profes, no? I know that in yeah. Ecuador, I think they call me Lisen, and I didn't get it. L L in South yeah. Africa, for example, here in Guayaquil, they say Lisen, they say profe. Yeah, when, teacher, when they, they told me Lisen, teacher. I was like, what? What is Lisen? And they, oh, okay, okay, teacher. <laughs> yeah. <The> licenciado. <laughs> yes, yes, I didn't get it at first. I got like three, four messages with Lisen, 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 Lisen. What do we have to do, Lisen? What is the homework? Lisen? And I was like, oh my God, I'm lost. <laughs> yes, and then it's gone. No, it's teacher. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, well, actually, uh, uh, I have taught uh, Ecuadorians in. Uh, <laughs> thank you. I'm I'm actually I, I taught and I'm teaching Ecuadorians who are, for example, in the United States right now, and Ecuadorians who are in Ecuador. Yes. Ecuadorians who are in Ecuador, Ecuadorians who are in the States, and Ecuadorians who are in other countries. Remaining in the online uh, session. Online, yes. Online sessions. Yes. For example, I have several students in uh, in New Year's from Ecuador, in New York, in New York, in Connecticut, in Pennsylvania in Pennsylvania, in Phoenix, uh, uh, and also, well, in Peru, some of them, a couple of them, but mostly in the in the United States and also in Ecuador. In Guayaquil, in Guayas. So um, my advice, I mean, to improve, the, the areas you have to improve, well, there are four skills, not input and output skills. Four skills are listening, speaking, reading, and writing. But I always insist on something. The other probably would disagree with me, but reading, trust me, it's kind of old fashioned, but it's the key. You have to read, no matter if it's oh, a I, serial I agree with box. You. Yes. Totally it's, agree with you. It's, it's, it's people like they get tired of reading. I don't know why. Reading is the key, believe it or not. It could be boring. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes it's you're tired from you know the screen and working and doing stuff at home and you know social engagements that you have but you have to read every day what helped me a lot is that i read not only in spanish not only in english but also in my mother tongue believe it or not the spanish is a much more complicated language than english absolutely so, absolutely so you have to read in Spanish, read a newspaper, read magazines, read websites, read blogs. Blogs are super interesting, okay? So get information, ask, always ask. The best way to learn something, it's not only reading, but also asking. If you don't know something, don't be afraid. There are probably, there are gonna be like 5% of people who are gonna say, hey, what do you want? Yeah, but the rest of people are going to be very, friendly or at least they're going to be decent enough to say oh this is this means this no and they are going to give you a hand because you're asking politely that's it so i don't know ¿Puedes ayudarme? ¿Qué quiere decir esto? Ah, esto es esto. so they are going to help you i know that the experience i've seen that in my students not because i was actually supervising them but also i entered some breakout rooms like you know in kahoot and i could listen the way they help the other students so i know that i know the way people act I, I, being the, here for a long time 
it's like I didn't need, I didn't have the need, I didn't have the the the, the necessity to go to the United States to learn the language. I learned the language in my country. My parent, my father spoke a little English. My mother spoke almost none. The only person who speaks perfect English in my family is my sister, actually. She speaks flawless British English, actually. With her, I have to speak British mostly. And she lives here too. And she also speaks French because she's a chef. Uh, but people in my family, I had an aunt who was an English teacher. I remember I, I used to help her checking exams from when I was a teenager. Great. But, uh, yeah, yes. things like it was that. a great way to practice. But practice, reading, it doesn't matter if you're reading wrong. Because sometimes I say, but who do I read to? To yourself. To yourself. Close the room of your room. And start reading anything, whatever you have. Yeah. Whatever you have. You know what? School, Sorry. Language you know. online school. Like that. Start reading. That's it. You know, you know what, dear Monica? Uh, uh well, it's it's a personal conclusion that I had made according to some uh data that I obtained when I made a, a survey, you know. Many people complain about reading because more that they feel that they can learn more it's because there's a lack of reading habit. It's a cultural problem, you know? It's a cultural problem, yes. Yeah, the, it, it, it comes from their parents or the, um, or the generation that comes to another generation, they don't read it. So if you don't read something, okay, about a topic that you really love or you find it interesting, uh, no matter what topic it is, even in sports, fashion, politicians, gossips, I don't know. Well, um, if you don't read it in Spanish or something, you cannot transfer that in English. It, 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 that's yes. it. So exactly. you need to read first in, in Spanish, in the mother tongue, to, 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 to derivate it into the second language. So that yes. I agree that point. Yes, yes. I haven't seen a similar question before, Miss Monica. How do you think we can improve the engagement in Ecuadorian students from your experience teaching Ecuadorians? I wasn't teaching them like in Peru. I was from Peru, but online all the time. The same thing, no? You can improve. I mean, you have a very rich culture, like mine culture. Your culture is amazing. You have amazing places. You have an amazing country. You just have to believe it. You, just, you cannot see it because you're living there too long. Okay, it's good to go and visit other places. But nothing is better than yours. Believe me, I'm telling you by experience, it's like that. Totally. So the thing is that you have to really appreciate that without having, I have had Ecuadorian students who have had the very emotional moments with me online during the pandemics and then after the pandemics, because they have so many problems in the United States, in other countries, in Central America, in South America and other countries, in my country, but they were alone and they were homesick. They miss our country. And then they recognize that they missed a lot of their, what is the name of the dish? And so Yadito or something like that. One of my students was saying, oh my God, that dish, I miss it so much. And because it's like, what it, it's, it's like an, a, an, a crazy thing, no? something that is that makes you remember home. So, and they were, they are adults, people in their thirties, people in their forties who are struggling, who have really tough struggles. You can do it. The only thing that you have to change is your mindset. Everything is here. You can do it. For example, right now, I told you my Portuguese was totally rusty. So I have promised myself that this year I'm going to unrust my Portuguese. So I'm doing it one Sunday at a time, but then 10 minutes every day, but on Sundays, I focus more on that. So that's what I'm doing because I really want to finish this year speaking fluent, super fluent Portuguese because I want to pass international examination. So uh, I have, as I have done with the other, with the other languages. So that's what I'm doing. It. Thank you. No, thank you so much. Uh, yes, here, of course. Here, Monique, we have to love our country. I, I have... would like to read a, a lot of questions, but I'm sorry because of the remaining time that yes. we have. Yeah. <laughs> well, so dear teachers, I'm so uh, excited that we have shared this teacher's interview with Miss Monica Perla. I would like to have a second round of teacher's interview with you, Miss Monica, to invite you to, to share with you more. I'd love to. I'd love to. This is amazing. Um, I had a great time. 
And I, I'm so happy that you mentioned Encebolladito because this is a typical dish. Yeah. <laughs> One of my students told me, so that's what I know. I need to, I need to, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.